So we're going to run this as we'll run this as a panel discussion, starting with Kyle Brazil, moving on to Dr. Cooper, who's going to talk about the um, implications on political rep representation, and finishing up with Dr. Klein, who's going to talk about funding changes that result from changes in the census. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Kyle Brazil. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for having me. It's an honor to be here this morning. I am stalling so I can share my screen. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Just a quick thumbs up. Awesome, wonderful. Um, again, it's a it's it's a pleasure to be here. I'm I'm so excited about this presentation. I'm excited about some of the information. Um, I'm not monitoring chat, so if there's questions as I'm going through, I know I have 30 minutes. Someone please stop me and read the question. I'm happy to go through, so we don't have to wait to the end. And it's also an honor to be here and be in another Zoom meeting with Dr. Cooper and Dr. Klein. It's it's great to see your faces as well. Um, I'm going to get right into it and talk a bit about the census work. And as I'm going, you have this wonderful artwork behind me, but it's about the census work. Um, and just to let you all know where we are and what has happened. There's so much going on in the state of North Carolina right now. Um, we are in the throes and the midst of redistricting, as you'll hear a bit about in a little bit. Um, we've got elections coming up very soon, you know, in November. And so we get to all of these places through census. A lot of the work that we have done at NC Counts and before was I think NC Census uh, was the name of the org before it became NC Counts Coalition. But it's making sure we get the count that we need and you'll see why it's so important, right? It's tied to funding, it's tied to political power, it is tied to um, the number of um, votes through the electoral college. And so it's very important. Uh, just where we are right now, the legacy format data files um, were available on August, actually, I think it was August 13th, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a Friday the 13th, um, those legacy format files became available. And in that information, in that raw data, we had some really good information on population counts for county, city, census blocks, um, and state-specific congressional legislative and voting districts. So the raw data. We had demographic data, um, race, Hispanic origin, voting age. Um, we had general housing unit counts, and it did not include everything, and there's additional data that's going to be released. I believe, for example, it did not include all of the little people, right, who live with us and, and all those details, um, but it did have general housing unit counts, um, just not breaking it down. Um, and we also had information on group quarters. Other key points in this census release and this information that we received that then again, it feeds into redistricting, it feeds into voting, it feeds into everything else that we do. Um, we're told that it was highly accurate with a 0.3% undercount. And so in, even as we were going through the pandemic um, and all of the issues that this census this time Usually the census is always right, difficult to do. You have to go and convince people to fill it out. But we had all of the extra layers of a pandemic on top of it, of you know um, delays and, and political pressure, I'll, I'll just say it that way. Um, and so even with all of that, we still had a very highly accurate account. Um, we know total populations and select characteristics, as I said. We don't know age structures and home ownership, um, but we did get new census topics. Um, and so same-sex relationship information was available. Uh, and so there were some questions that were changed from single response questions to now double response questions. And so um, previously, I believe it was an opposite sex, husband, wife, spouse question and or unmarried person. Um, and then it was changed to opposite sex and um, you, or you could put it same sex, husband, wife, spouse relationship. Um, and then ancestry origin data as well um, was new in this census report. And so what did this yield? What do we have? Um, six states gained seats in the House. Texas gained two because of an increase in population. Uh, Colorado, Florida, Montana, 
Oregon and in our fair state of North Carolina, my fair state of North Carolina gained a seat. Um, seven states lost a seat in the House, including California, which never, which, which was the first time they had lost a seat um, in history. And so the loss is California, Illinois, Michigan, uh, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Getting a lot of amazing information from the wonderful folks at Carolina Demography. Um, but one really important portion of this is New York, right? This is, this is the story to tell. This is why we have to get people out um, knocking on doors and calling and, and getting an accurate census count. New York lost a seat by 89 people. So had they had those additional 89 people, they would have kept what they had, right? And, and I can literally think, you know, having visited New York, my brother lives in New York, um, that's a block, right? That is perhaps just an apartment building for some of these apartments in New York, in the city in Manhattan. So they lost a seat by 89. Um, that means that, you know, compared to other folks, other states, they're, they're gonna have less representatives. And then for the electoral college, what this meant, um, there were see, uh, several states that gained, and you'll see this is you know across the board, right? Um, those states that lost population, you see coming in, losing congressional seat, but also losing an electoral college seat. And then those states gaining, Texas gaining two, North Carolina gaining one. Um, and again, the importance of the census as it filters out into our political power as a nation. And so the data for North Carolina, really exciting, a lot of growth in our state. Um, we saw a 9.5 increase and I'll share with you all with some specificity as to where we saw that population increase. Um, but we saw a huge, well, for me, I, I would consider it huge. That's not a statistically you know, relevant term, but it was a good population increase of 900,000. Um, our population went from 9.5 to about 10.4 million. And keep that 10.4 million in the back of your mind. Um, we'll see that number and how that number plays out in a little bit. Over the same period though, 51 North Carolina counties lost population for a total combined loss of 147 and 49 counties gained population. And so even though overall there's this huge increase, right? 9.5% increase. Um, if you look at the counties that gained and lost, you'll see that a lot of the gains are in our urban areas and a lot of the losses are in our rural places. And so fastest growth in North Carolina, um, I don't think it's a mystery, right? We have uh, tech firms popping up in the triangle all the time, lots of business going on in Charlotte. Um, I know at least four um, folks who retired to the coast to Wilmington. And so the faster, fastest growth in North Carolina occurred in the triangle in Charlotte um, and in Wilmington um, in the green, as you see. And then as you go into the brown, and there's another graphic that'll show that a little bit easier and a little bit better on your eyes you'll see those that lost population. The five largest counties in North Carolina, Wake County and Mecklenburg, right? With, if we were talking about 10 million, so they're, they're all right there um, uh, for the state. Guilford, Forsyth and Cumberland, those are the five largest counties in North Carolina. And they, were, they remain the five largest. They still have the crown from 2010. The five fastest growing counties in North Carolina, we have Johnston, Brunswick, uh, Wake, Durham, Cabarrus County as well, and they're in the middle. Um, and so these counties, of course, I, I'm not sure if there's any surprise with Johnston, Wake, or Durham, um, perhaps Brunswick or Cabarrus, but still very fast growing counties. And the largest population losses. Um, and so if you overlay this with some of the population centers in the urban areas, you'll see that a lot of the loss came from the more rural towns. Um, and especially, right, we call it in North Carolina down east, that, um, what is it, the I-95 corridor. Um, you know, this, it's, it's, it, it's remarkable. You, you, if you could overlay the interstate on here, um, you probably, you know, see that it's right there in this portion that's tending to blue. Five smallest counties there for you as well. Five counties with the largest population decrease, just so you all have that information as well. Um, and I won't go through and, and say each one, but just I think really good information um, as we get to get a sense of 
how our population is shifting and how North Carolina is changing and has changed over the last 10 years. So that's urban rule. We also saw changes demographically. Now there is a portion of this change that I wanna speak on in a bit about um, multiracial, um, but we see the race ethnicity identified 60% white, 20% African-American, 11% Latinx, 3.9% uh, multiracial, 3.3% Asian. Um, and what that breaks down and looks like for, you know, over time, um, North Carolina continues to diversify, right? Um, we see our 1990 uh, population, um, which in, in 1990, it was soundly split 75%, 22% African-American. Um, and then we move, you know, to the 2000s to now to 2020, 60% white, 20% African-American, 11% Hispanic. Important to note here that um, the groups that had the largest increase in population, Hispanic, multiracial, and Asian groups had um, the largest increase in population. Um, and I believe it is Asian American um, had the highest percent increase. And there's the graphic. You all, and of course of note, American Indian uh, decrease. Or Hispanic, show the uh, Latinx community show the highest overall increase. But again, um, the numbers I saw in the data I saw, Asian American have the highest percent increase. So a portion of this from the census though, is that if you see, if you look at the census, the, the largest groups that grew, right? We have 207% growth in some other race and 161% for multiracial. Um, and so a portion of this increase, right, is you talk to the statisticians and the so social scientists, that increase is indicative of the changes to the question that the census asked. And so the census broadened their scope. They allowed for multiple selections of race and ethnicity. Um, and there's a lot more nuance to that. And so the end result, yes, there is this increase, but there's also an increase that's based upon the way the question was asked, and I believe there's still ongoing research um, to get to the bottom of that and see how that compares, what those numbers truly mean in comparison to 10 years ago. So from our friends at Carolina Demography, um, what is this what we expected? Well, they're saying that more counties than expected lost population and the losses were larger than expected, right? And so really I think the shock is that the rural areas of North Carolina lost so much. I think there was always the anticipation and the expectation that, you know, Charlotte is Charlotte, Mecklenburg County is Mecklenburg, um, and the triangle is just growing leaps and bounds. I mean, just go to Franklin Street at Chapel Hill, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I moved down here compared to now, it looks completely different and you can just feel the growth in the triangle. Um, so I don't think any of that was unexpected, but what is unexpected is the large loss in population, especially in the rural areas. Now this ties in really closely and neatly with redistricting, um, which I know presenters in a bit are gonna talk a little bit about um, that. And so that number I told you all to remember earlier, right? We had that total population of what is it, 10.4 million, I believe it was. Um, and so what this means, right, in terms of getting this extra seat, well, we had 13 congressional districts before, based upon the math and the way those congressional districts are split for you know, the state, we will get a new one, we will get a 14th. And so based upon the population size, because the number one criteria is equal population, you divide that 10 million by 14, and you get this ideal district size of 745,000. And so that is the ideal size. There is some variance there. There can be a bit of deviation. I think it's a 5% deviation in some of this criteria for how they draw um, the political boundaries, but <laughs> it still has to be close to 745,000. So what that means is looking at all of our congressional districts, and knowing that we need to add a 14th, all of the districts need to be redrawn. Um, there's no 
if, ands, or buts. Everything has to shift, has to change because either the populations, almost nearly all of the populations are too large, um, or we have um, you know, the first congressional district being too small. And even though the third congressional district is nearly right where it needs to be, well, you have a 14th to add and all these others are changing. So I doubt the third and the fifth congressional districts are gonna look the same. So what's next in this sphere? What, what is going on next? And, and really how you all can you know, step up and, and continue to be involved. Redistricting is ongoing. Um, there are um, actually, there's two public comment hearings on Monday and Tuesday of this week. The legislature has released some of those draft maps um, for, for discussion. Um, there's more data that we will get, more demographic data and more housing characteristic data that will be released in 2022. And then, you know, the fight for funds, as I know my panelists will talk about, um, I, I believe the overall figure, it's, it's trillions of dollars and 40 or 50 billion of dollars typically allocated to the state of North Carolina. I'm not the expert in that field, but just know, right, that's what's going on next. There's funding allocations to be considered as well. And it's important to note that since this is not in a vacuum, as I mentioned, it's tied to funding, tied to redistricting, tied to political power, um, but also the, the census work is ongoing. I think we finally moved past that sense of every 10 years we do this work. Well, because of the nature of the world these days, especially living through a pandemic, but also sort of being more connected than we ever have been to people through Zoom, but not because we're in a pandemic, we realize we have to build out this infrastructure and keep this infrastructure going so that we're not restarting everything every 10 years. And so census work, the education around census work is ongoing. I'd also say, and it's an easier thing to talk about, redistricting work is ongoing, right? Especially in North Carolina, because even though it has to happen every 10 years, um, it, it gets challenged and changed every, what, three or four years in our fair state. So, you know, all of this work is ongoing and we just have to keep plugging in um, and doing that work um, and keeping informed and staying informed as we move forward. I'd encourage you all to learn more. Um, and I'd also encourage you all to pr provide a public comment on redistricting. Um, and, and that's just what's going on right now. So I wanted to leave you all with that. Uh, there are public comments right now. You can go into the North Carolina General Assembly and I can drop that link in chat if you all want that information to provide comments on fair districts. There's also a lot of training going on in this space uh, for people who want to provide comments. And so those are sort of the action items if you were to talk about just today. Uh, but for census work, this stuff, as I said, is ongoing and there's some amazing work going on by us, but also partners throughout this space. And then some quick resources. Um, I always plug, of course, uh, our friends at Carolina Demography. They have a phenomenal blog. They really get into the details and the data, and, uh, the data, and they they're a great resource for all of us uh, closet statistical nerds out there. And then we have some amazing information. The census.gov website. Um, if you go to it, it's actually a bit more intuitive than you'd expect, you know, a, a federal government website to be. Um, there's a lots of data that you can download, there's reports, there's PDFs you can review, there's some really good information on the census, and some of it goes deep into states uh, with some analysis that you'll see there. So I'd encourage you all to check out both. Um, I'd say Carolina Demography because I'm just partial to the work they do, because uh, they, they just do a phenomenal job at the census as well. Just awesome information out there is available to you all. Um, and thank you all. So Kyle, we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, and there were a, a couple of people who are really interested in getting copies of the slides presented. So if you can send those to me, I'll get them out to attendees after this is over. Um, so the first question, what's the impact of the lower completion of the census in North Carolina? And does that impact the results? In terms of the... Um... And I believe that's a, that's a nationwide decrease, or or the the 0.3 percent off. Um, well, I, I think there's still a lot of data that has to go into figuring out um, who, you know, what that represents. Does that represent a lot of folks in urban areas, you know, and why is that there? Is that because 
folks weren't opening up their doors during the pandemic. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't really feel comfortable trying to, you know, making an assessment on um, what that means for our state. But I think the data and, and the analysis that's going to come from that will be based on um, trying to figure out where that lack of completion is, right? And, and is it in the urban areas? Is it focused in on um, our Latinx community? You know, perhaps not opening those doors or filling out the forms. I, I think that's what a lot of that data is going to, um, the next I, steps are going to be on. Can I add some, some information, Kyle? As, uh, as Kyle said, it's, it's, I think it's a little bit too early to kind of understand whether or not uh, we had an undercount or an overcount or where those undercounts or overcounts were. There's some there's always an analysis that goes on after the, each decennial census. And in fact, there's one going on right now. It's the post evaluation survey. Um, and so that will, that's usually the one that we use to understand whether or not there was an undercount or overcount. Typically in each decennial census, there's always overcounts and undercounts in different populations um, for a lot of different factors. And the reason why um, the NC counts folks were here was really to push for focusing on some communities that are always undercounted or typically undercounted. And those are people typically in areas where high, with high poverty, um, um, minority populations, Hispanic, African-American populations. Um, and those, those areas that we, um, as Kyle said, you know, we saw losses in rural areas that ex we did expect to see uh, rural losses, but in some of those areas, they were a lot lower than we expected. So we're still kind of exploring a lot of information there. And those Eastern counties or, you know, carries with, uh, counties with Lumbee population, with African-American populations, with areas of high poverty. So those are typically the areas that are typically undercounted. Now, the good news is that the census does a lot of different things to make sure there's a complete count. Uh, the reason why we really push for everybody to respond by themselves um, is because that's the best case for us to be able to capture all the information, not only how many people live in your household, but your characteristics of that household. Um, and But there's other things that census does to complete that. So there's knocking on doors, there's talking to neighbors, and then, and then finally doing some imputations. So there's different ways to get a complete count um, and to but it's st still too early to know where those undercounts and overcounts may be in the nation and also um, statewide. Just to give you an, uh, our la latest estimates came in, came in a little bit higher, about 140,000 or so higher than what the census counts came in. Um, so we, we had an, if you assume the estimates were correct, that's about a 1.3% below. Uh, what what our latest estimates, but there's a lot of issues with that. So, uh, but that's just if you want to compare it to the estimates to to see where where that is. Anyway, sorry. Thanks, Mike. Um, how is employment connected to the rural decline in population, Kyle? I think that's a great question. I don't think I'm qualified though, and and I don't I don't I don't really know. And I would turn to Dr. Klein or Dr. Cooper maybe. Okay. To talk about that? Sure. I, so those, and the reason why we, so if you look at those patterns that Kyle showed, the areas of high growth or those high tech counties, urban counties, and if you look nationwide, those are also the areas that are growing is mainly metropolitan urban counties. Growth is typically in rural areas. In fact, we saw a huge loss in the United States as a whole in rural counties. Um, and it's just because things have changed in those areas. I mean, farming does, takes a lot of capital, but it takes less labor. And then all the processes that are tied to that, uh, the areas that saw gains in rural areas were either areas with high natural amenities, so the retirement destinations, or they had um, extra, um, mining extraction and that, like oil and gas, which is kind of boom and bust. So they had a pretty good decade last decade, but then towards the end of the decade, it kind of busted. So, um, so yeah, so that employment is tied to that. Basically people graduate from high school in rural areas and they go to urban areas. That's where the opportunities are and they stay. So. Great. Um, I think 
several of these other questions may be addressed by our next presenter. So if we're ready, um, I think I'll turn it over to Chris Cooper to talk about political representation as a result of the census. Dr. Cooper? All right, fantastic. Thanks. Let me do this and start it. And can I get a thumbs up if it's coming up from somebody? Great, thanks. You would think after what, a year and a half of a pandemic, I don't know how many talks, teaching online, that I would have this thing down, but not so much. Um, my students make fun of me because evidently when I click to make the whole thing go on, I sort of squint and so that they, they really enjoy that part. Uh, but I'm really glad to be here today. I learned a ton from the, the last presentation. I uh, was excited to hear from Kyle. I'm excited to hear what, what Mike's got to say. Um, I don't think the three of us ever met before, although Mike and I have exchanged uh, music, similar musical taste, I believe, on Twitter. But uh, so I'm glad to see him in person. Glad to be here with all of y'all. And I'll just echo just briefly a couple of things Kyle said. I'll probably echo more throughout the talk. Uh, but one, North Counter Demography uh, folks are amazing. So I completely agree with Kyle. Their blog is so helpful and they're good. It's good writing, it's good data presentation, and it's good information. So if uh, if you follow up on nothing else from, from my talk anyway, um, I, I do encourage you to go there. And also just a fu fun and sad addition to Kyle's point about New York, which I think is such a great example of, of why counting matters. Um, a paper was just published in a journal called Social Science Quarterly, and the authors found that the, um, uh, the differential impact of COVID deaths is directly responsible for the apportionment in New York losing that seat. In other words, so many people died of COVID in New York State, and more so than other states, that that is attributable to, that's why they lost a seat. So it really is a, a fascinating and discouraging example of, I think, how our public health and um, uh, political health are often related. So um, with that said, I am gonna um, probably, I'm gonna talk about history a little bit today, kind of how we got here, bigger picture stuff, and then we'll drill down to exactly where we are today. Um, Kyle did a great job setting me up for, for what I needed to talk about, so thanks. Um, but I'll just say at the outset, too, I'm going to talk mostly about Congress today, um, not because I think it's necessarily the most important, but because I think it's one we can wrap our heads around, okay? So it's really important to note on the front end that when we talk about redistricting in North Carolina, this time we're talking about congressional redistricting. We're talking about local redistricting. So I just grabbed MEC as an example, but certainly there's a lot of local redistricting going on. Um, there is 120 members of our state house. Those districts are gonna have to be redrawn and 50 members of our state Senate. So most of the media coverage, at least that I've seen, tends to be focused on where is this 14th seat gonna go? I even saw a question in chat about where's the 14th seat gonna go? And it's fun, like I get it, I get why that is the conversation that people want to have. But I would just say all the other political implications are not any smaller, right? I mean, years ago when I would do talks like this, I would say things like, you know, you have to redistrict school boards if they're in districts. And people would think, why do I care about school boards? Well, I think if the last year has taught us anything, it's that school boards, of course, are critical agents of democracy as well. So I'm going to sort of contribute to what I try not to, which is to talk mostly about Congress, but I did want to say at the beginning that these other types of redistricting are critical. And I'll also say at the outset that the rules for Congress will sort of leave, leave local redistricting in its own place because obviously those rules are, are different and vary by locality, but co congressional redistricting and state legislative or general assembly redistricting have uh, different rules. So Kyle talked really well um, about uh, population equality concerns. And it's really important to remember those are different for the General Assembly than they are for Congress. So for the General Assembly, they have to be within five percentage points of population. All, they have, all the districts have to be within five percentage points of each other. Um, for Congress, they have to have the same number of people in every district, right, down to a one. So the rules are different. Uh, we also don't, won't have time, I don't think today, to go deep into the weeds, unless people want to in Q&A, about the county clustering rules. But 
in kind of big, broad 10,000 foot terms for Congress, um, you're not supposed to split counties, but there are no rules that say which counties have to hang together. For the General Assembly, there are rules based on this Stevenson decision that say that certain counties have to hang together. So they're starting with much more of a blank slate uh, for Congress than they are for the General Assembly. It doesn't mean that there's not a tremendous amount of discretion because there is on the General Assembly side, but they, are, they have a little bit more constraint as to where they start drawing the map. So it's like a 20% you know, filled in map. So, um, and I guess before I get to the rest of it too, I'll say on the 14th seat, Kyle said this very well, probably better than I'm going to, but I think it's really important. So I'll repeat it in worse terms. Um, the 14th again is, you know, that's what we all want to pay attention to because it's fun. But the way I like to think about it is the 14th district, it's like dropping a huge boulder in the middle of a lake, right? Yes, the point of impact of that boulder is a big deal, but you're going to have ripples that move to the edge of the lake as well. And you're going to see the same thing for congressional redistricting. So yes, we're going to drop a 14th district somewhere in our state, but all the other districts are going to be affected by population shifts in general, but also by the location of that 14th district. So again, fun, interesting, very important, but um, do pay attention to the shifts in the other districts as well. So just real brief, uh, how did we get here? Right. The Constitution says, U.S. Constitution at this point, says we got to count people every 10 years. U.S. Constitution says we're going to get one representative for every 30,000 people and every state gets one. Well, if we stuck to that second point, we would have thousands and thousands of members of Congress. So if you think you really aren't real fond of the 435, imagine if there were like 8,000 of those people running around the country, right? So we changed those numbers. Um, but we do still, of course, say every state gets at least one. So you can be Wyoming with more cows than people, and you're still going to get one. Um, doesn't matter how few or, well, it doesn't matter how many, doesn't matter how few people live in Wyoming and count people every 10 years. Um, and then it kind of says, hey, states, you guys figure this stuff out. And so what we see is a tremendous variety all over the map, really, in terms of how states do redistricting. In North Carolina, we are not just General Assembly first, we're General Assembly dominated, right? So in most states that have their state legislatures draw lines, the governor has veto power, right? So the governor can say, no, I don't like those lines, send them back. North Carolina, the governor does not have veto power. This is critical. So the General Assembly right now, as Kyle talked about very well, is drawing these lines. Roy Cooper, you, me, Mike, Kyle, we all have the same amount of power over what these lines look like, which is to say not very much, right? Roy Cooper does not have that veto power. Uh, my favorite ironic, I think it's ironic, North Carolina politics story is the reason the governor doesn't have veto power is that uh, there was a legislator, a uh, General Assembly member who drew up a bill, there were competing bills, to finally give our governor the veto power. We're the last state in the country to do so. And so that General Assembly member drew it up, it went, it got passed, they gave the governor veto power, but not over redistricting and not over local bills. The name of that state legislator was uh, Roy Cooper. So in other words, Roy Cooper 20 years ago handcuffed Roy Cooper of today in terms of redistricting. But it is really important to know that he does not have veto power. So how did we get here? I think most, this is a super intelligent, engaged audience. You'll probably know this, right? But just bears uh, repeating maybe for the one or two that don't. Um, and I think this illustrates why it's such a hard concept to wrap our head around. We now know what the Constitution says. We now know what the North Carolina rules are in general. Um, the term gerrymandering comes from a cartoon. Uh, a political cartoon, right? So Elbridge Gary, turns out his name was pronounced with a hard G. We've been softening his G for 200 years. Poor guy. We use it. He's a pejorative and we're screwing up his name. Um, it, he was the governor of Massachusetts. I won't go into the whole story. There's even some question about whether he even wanted this map, but they drew a map that benefited their own party, his party, which happened to be the Republican Party in this case. Um, and so there was a political cartoon. It became known as a gerry gerrymander or gerrymander. Um, I say this to say, I think this is one reason why it's people say, why can't you just identify cleanly what a gerrymander is? And 
it is a concept that was literally created by cartoonists. So I, I like to say, this is like if somebody said, what's a cat? And I said, well, let's use Garfield as a starting point, right? How much does it look like Garfield? So over time, we've developed really sophisticated ways to detect gerrymandering, but initially it's a concept that's been around for a long time and initially came from a cartoon. So just to catch up on North Carolina briefly, um, we've been doing gerrymandering for a long time here. We were doing it when the Democrats were in charge, we're doing it when the Republicans were in charge. So um, sort of the classic book about Southern politics is by a guy named V.O. Key. Um, and his discussion of North Carolina politics in the 1940s, he says, um, despite the concentration of those counties in the West, the Republicans uh, won not a single representative. Bacon strip congressional districts cut across the highlands in Piedmont to smother the Republicans by linking Republican counties in the West with heavier Democratic counties in the East and South. In other words, in the 1940s, the Democrats were engaging in gerrymandering. I like to call, because it's the bacon plus the smother, I like to call this the Waffle House theory of gerrymandering. Okay, you get a little bit of scattered, smothered, and covered maybe. Uh, in 1991, the Wall Street Journal weighed in on North Carolina's redistricting. They uh, said if it were submitted to the National Endowment for the Arts, it might win a grant for abstract art. Many people would simply call it computer-generated pornography. This is talking about democratically drawn lines, right? They then went on and call it a travesty. They offer an example of cautionary tale of what voters in many other states can expect. This is in 1991. This is, uh, we won't go into too much detail on it just because of time, but when they talk about computer generated pornography, if you're wondering what they're looking at, they're looking at this 12th district, um, which has been legislated probably more than any other single district in the country. Um, the joke uh, was that if you open your car door on I-85, your handle would be in a different district than the rest of your car, right? And so you jump from, you know, if, parts of Charlotte to they grab parts of Greensboro, they grab parts of Winston uh, and went right into Durham. Okay, so that's the political pornography uh, one. And I think, again, it's important before we start talking about what the Republicans have been doing in North Carolina to talk about when the tables were turned. So on the left uh, is an article by a Republican um, who later became famous for some different things, uh, who says, but where liberals and gerrymandering. And so he goes on and, you know, talks about these, these liberals that are doing all this gerrymandering. And then my favorite one is this one on the right, which obviously we're not going to read, but I'll sometimes uh, black out par uh, the party names, hand it out to students and ask them to guess when this was written and by whom. I mean, you really could flip it right on its head for today, okay? So they're saying, the state Senate approved district boundaries. Um, the Republicans accused the Democrats of gerrymandering. The Democrats are then jumping in and saying that they have uh, uh, acting in good faith. The uh, GOP senators said the map doesn't serve their interest, shuffles a disproportionate number of Republican voters into districts represented by Republicans, therefore packing them in. I mean, you could switch the party names and it would be a perfect, like Will Duran could put this in the News and Observer tomorrow with the party name switched. And you'd say, wow, that's a really good description of what the Republicans are doing in the state of North Carolina. So the Democrats controlled our state for a long time and it showed, okay? Um, along come the Republicans in 2010. They make a very explicit strategy to, draw, to take over general assemblies and state legislatures to draw lines to benefit Republicans. Again, Democrats are doing it, Republicans say, let's do it. They give it a fancy name, they call it Project Red Map, and they're off to the races, okay? So they, in the 2011 round of redistricting, they did some uh, uh, pretty interesting little moves. I think they're best represented in the ones I put in purple. So the incumbents on the left, who won the following election, and then the John McCain vote, which I put up there because he's the last Republican who would run for president. And what you see, first of all, is they double bunked, in other words, stuck two of the same party together for two Democrats in the fourth, two Democrats in the eighth. Of course, the Democrat in the fourth, David Price, just announced that he's retiring. Um, but that's a good way to obviously benefit your party. And the other neat, well, the other thing they did that was very successful was they made the 11th, the farthest west district. They carved out Asheville, stuck it in the 10th, gave it to Patrick McHenry, 
Uh, they then turned the 11th district from the most competitive district in the state to the most Republican district in the state overnight. Keith Shuler was a Democrat. Shuler says, I'm out. I'm going to spend more time with my family. Um, we then get a competitive primary, a second primary. Mark Meadows becomes the member of Congress from the 11th Congressional District, obviously later becomes Chief of Staff to Trump. I won't go into that whole story. The point is redistricting mattered. And it mattered, I think it's, when people first think about it, I think, well, like, where do these voters go? Remember, we don't do anything with the voters. We just draw the lines around them. And I think the 11th and the 10th is such a good example of how that happened. So, and you can sort of see that on this map. Um, so what happens legally? I mean, the court says a lot of things, and this is obviously a gross oversimplification, but they said, look, you can't draw lines with race as a predominant factor. They said, you gotta have contiguous districts. They said, you gotta have the same number of people in every district, different states have their own rules. There was this big question about partisan advantage. Okay, can you have too much partisan advantage? So we started to see a series of lawsuits, not really at the uh, federal level, but at the state level. So I know I'm speaking right after a lawyer, uh, so I should be very, very careful with what I have to say since Kyle's on the call here. Hopefully he won't say that I'm screwing this up too much, but essentially we started to see more lawsuits based on state constitutions instead of on federal in the federal constitution, right? And so there were a couple of cases in North Carolina, Common Cause v. Lewis was one, they then used the state constitution and some of the lines in the state constitution to say, hey, people's rights are being infringed upon. And eventually the court jumped in. This was a state legislative case, general assembly case. And they said, court said, you're right. This was too far. And uh, we then saw a very similar decision in a congressional case. And there's a lot of question now, how much will the Republicans who are in charge of our general assembly listen to these cases? And how much will they just decide to push the agenda anyway? Obviously, I don't know the answer. We don't have any formal maps yet. We don't know what they, we don't have any final maps anyway. We don't know what they're going to decide on. So I don't know whether, you know, sort of the brushback pitch of Common Cause v. Lewis and what came after is going to change legislative behavior or not. So how do we detect gerrymandering? And I don't know, I've been sort of thinking about this. I'd be curious to see if this works for y'all, but kind of, there's no one answer. Um, and that's really frustrating. So sometimes people will say, you know, what is a gerrymander? And I think what they want is like some measure, like, well, if you're a 20.1 on this scale, then it's a gerrymander. And if it's a 20 on the scale, it's not a gerrymander. And the more I think about it, one, that's it's not happening. But I guess I would challenge this notion a little bit that we should have one metric. And my example, I was mountain, I mountain bike a lot. And so I was mountain biking with a friend of mine who's a, um, a botanist. And uh, we were talking about trails and where to put trails in the western part of the state. And this person said, well, you know, this is a great spot to put a trail where we have to be riding. They said, this is, a, it's a degradated forest. It's not a, it's not a healthy forest, Chris. So we can slap some trails in here and it's okay for the environment as opposed to this other spot where I was selfishly saying I wanted to mountain bike. And I said, well, why, how do you know that? And the person said, well, look around. You see a lot of invasive species. You see the soil is completely degraded. You see that the healthy trees aren't coming through. And they gave me like four or five different examples of why it is a degraded forest, why it's not a healthy forest. And, you know, I took all that together and I thought, okay, given every, all these different points this person's telling me, yeah, I buy it, right? I buy that there's this thing called a healthy forest. There's a thing called a degraded forest. And these are good indicators. And so I think for gerrymandering, maybe as opposed to searching for a silver bullet, we should begin thinking about it more like the way we think about what's a healthy forest. We need to think about multiple inputs, multiple ways of measuring these things. So some, and this is not an exhaustive list, and I won't be able to go into a lot of detail in every one, but one way people do it is they examine political outcomes. And they'll, you'll see this in the news a lot. They'll say, okay, we've got you know, X number of members of some party uh, represented at the congressional level or the general assembly level, but that they actually only received Y proportion of the, or they received Y proportion of the vote. And those two numbers are off, right? That's one way. Uh, they'll examine racial outcomes and they'll say, okay, racial, this racial minority group is, um, you know, X proportion of the state. 
but it's only X minus five uh, proportion of representation in some way. Sometimes they'll look at legislative record and intent, right? Legislators sometimes will say the quiet part out loud. They'll go on record and say, we only have a 10-3 map because I couldn't figure out a way to get to an 11-2 map. Or they'll say something like that, right? We've got a lot of really smart mathematicians, including some of those that are closer to y'all geographically, like Jonathan Mattingly and some of those folks at Duke who have the quantifying gerrymandering project. Um, and so they'll get, essentially they do a lot of really complicated, cool math, but what they're roughly doing, the way I like to think about it, is they're comparing the maps that are drawn to what would be randomness, right? What proportion of the time would you see a map with a certain outcome? And there are different people who have different ways they do that, but roughly that's what happens. Um, sometimes people examine political choices. Hey, look, when we drew this map, they grabbed this precinct as opposed to these precincts. And by doing that, they flipped it in a certain way, right? So the point, of, and there are other ways too, the point I'm trying to make is, I think you need all these. I don't think, that the solution, whether it's the Democrats doing the gerrymandering in Illinois, which they are doing and it's horrible, or the Republicans doing it in other states, there's not going to be a satisfactory one measure answer, in my opinion. I think we need to think about it like we think about a forest, like we think about your own personal health, right? We have all these different ways and metrics we think about. So, um, you know, what would choices look like? Just very briefly, you know, uh, one of the last rounds of redistricting, um, you can see where a district was drawn and grabbed just part of Wilmington, but grabbed the bluest bordering precincts in Wilmington. So you can compare choices made there. In terms of intent, the, uh, the Common Cause v. Lewis case had this sort of famous example of this guy named Tom Hoffler on the right, and um, very long story, but Hoffler passed away. His hard drive ended up in the hands of um, some attorneys. And so they were able to look and say, okay, what, what was Hoffler trying to do when he drew these maps? When did he draw those maps, right? So again, looking at intent. So after all these cases, these are the maps we ended up with. Um, they're only gonna be on the docket for this last round. I think like Kyle said very well, we like to think about redistricting as every 10 years, but the reality is uh, we've had four different maps in the last 10 years in the state of North Carolina. So I like to tell people we draw lines in North Carolina more often than we hold the Summer Olympics, right? We are doing it pretty constantly and there's a lot of shifts. So where are we now? And then I'll sort of close out. Um, Kyle, I think very nicely went over this timeline, probably better than I will. Um, but the new census data were released. We heard a lot about that, what that looks like. So that gives us our kind of metrics and targets. They establish criteria. So some of these are controversial, some are not. So they said, hey, we got to have population equality and they defined that for Congress and for the General Assembly. They said, we're not going to use partisan data. Everybody kind of agrees that's a good idea people disagree about the degree to which it matters. I won't go into that, but that's kind of where the lines are. No racial data, which is a bigger point of contention. So everybody agrees no partisan data is good. How good it is, eh, different people have different opinions. No racial data, essentially, some people are saying this is a good thing if you're trying to draw, you know, maps that, uh, that don't take race into account, then why would you take race into account? And the other side is saying, well, how can you detect um, uh, racial problems? How can you detect Voting Rights Act violations if you don't have racial data? So there's kind of the fight there. Um, and incumbency protection, if possible. This is another one. It bakes in part of the map, right? So you can see in uh, the map I have on the right, which I'll get to in a second, uh, you can see a little carve out here in Watauga County. Well, that carve out is happens to be where Virginia Fox lives. So if one were going to infer some intent, they could say, hey, maybe they didn't want to put Madison Cawthorn and Virginia Fox in the same district. No double bunking of incumbents, okay? They held 13 hearings throughout the state. A lot of controversy about those hearings. Um, they had a couple of weeks of open drawing. So you could actually get online, go to YouTube, watch people draw maps. So I like to think about this like, um, you know, watching a co-author work on a Google Doc from afar but a Google Doc that will fundamentally change the nature of representation in our state. Uh, but you could actually watch them draw these lines. Um, we're having some more open hearings Monday and Tuesday and votes I think are gonna be soon. I mean, we're gonna have maps out there 
that have been voted on uh, very soon. So I've given you one example and I really wanna stress, this is one random example. So please, please, please don't say, I'm thinking this is the map. I'm not, I'm saying this is what one potential map that has been proposed looks like. Um, we don't know what the final maps are going to be in the end. Uh, so that's uh, kind of roughly what I had. I'm happy to take Q&A now or just push it to after Mike's presentation and, and do it then. Uh, we just had uh, maybe one pretty specific question for you. I think you've answered most of the others that were posted previously. Uh, can you speak to the differences um, in or advances in technology before 2010 compared to now in how redistricting happens? Um, massive. <laughs> um, I would add, it was a great question, and yes, I mean, you can even see in the uh, Wall Street Journal thing I teased from 1991, they talk about the advances in computers. I think it's, I think it's really important, so I'm not downplaying that at all. I will add, I think just as much or maybe even more of what's happened in the pinpoint accuracy of redistricting and gerrymandering is yes, it's the computers, but it's also the voting patterns, right? Increasingly our voting patterns are predictable. Increasingly they are locked in. Increasingly geographic areas are uh, more consistent in how they vote. So yes, it's part, you know, anybody can get on Dave's redistricting app and draw these lines themselves, but it's also the certainty with what's going to happen is higher than it used to be. So if you say, is gerrymandering more effective than it used to be? There's actually a good book over to my right that I will put up that shows, yes, 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 it's way more effective now than it used to be. In other words, effective in getting a partisan in. And I would say it's computers, but it's also us. It's the way we vote. And so if I'm a, trying to draw a map to benefit the Democrats in Illinois or the Republicans in North Carolina, I now know if I grab that block, it's gonna do what I want it to do. Great. Uh, let's see, maybe one more question. What's the best way to undertake redistricting? Is it the independent commission concept using state legislatures? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it is um, a type of independent redistricting commission, but I would caution people um, calling it an independent redistricting commission doesn't make it independent. You see a lot of different models throughout the country. You see some really good ones or ones that I think are really good. And you see some where they call it independent redistricting, but in reality, it is um, people that are appointed by the people in power. And if people in power are all of one party, whether it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, all you've done is just passed on gerrymandering to somebody else. So I think it is a, a style or it is a type of independent redistricting. It's definitely not what we have in North Carolina. Um, and I do think there is hope there. I think we see some good models in other states. I am um, very concerned with what I see as the arms race of redistricting. Um, look, right now it's the Republicans who have been uh, gerrymandering North Carolina. It was the Democrats before then. And so I'm seeing some Democrats respond to what the Democrats are doing in Illinois, which is horrible, and saying basically turnabout's fair play. And I think that's what got us in this position in the first place. So I really think we've got to take it out of the hands of the people who can benefit. Um, you know, it'd be like having you set your own salary. I bet that's already looked pretty good. Uh, having you set your own terms of contract, I bet you probably wouldn't get fired. Um, you know, there's 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 a reason we should have checks and balances, and I think an independent commission is our best chance. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really fascinating. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Mike, and uh, we'll hear a little bit about impacts on funding. Okay, I will uh, see if I can set this up. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Kyle, uh, or Chris and Kyle. Very interesting. Uh, one, uh, I think Kyle pre presented a lot of good information about what's going on in North Carolina in terms of population change. 
And Chris, I, I really, it's fascinating to see kind of the background of North Carolina's political history. And I'm still kind of, I'm very, fairly new to North Carolina. I'll be here almost five years um, in uh, April. Uh, but, so I'm still kind of learning the, the ins and outs of, of North Carolina politics, having lived most of my life in Texas. I actually happen to be in Texas right now visiting family. So it's uh, great that we were able to use technology. Uh, just a little quick story. I, I used to work for, uh, I worked at a research institute at Rice University, and it was named Hobby Center for the Study of Texas. It was initially funded by the longest serving lieutenant governor of Texas, which in Texas, unlike North Carolina, the lieutenant governor actually, and some people say actually has more power than the governor. Um, and he uh, was, he always shares stories about back in the day when he was lieutenant governor, he was a Democrat. And he talked about redistricting. He actually had a congressman from, I believe, Laredo, who uh, was on the military affairs committee in Congress and was really thought that was important. That was his thing. So he wanted to make sure that as many military bases that he could be in his could be in his district. So his his district stretched from Laredo to San Antonio. There's some Air Force bases on Western uh, San Antonio, and and he he talked to the lieutenant governor, and you know in that case they had a little bit more power in drawing that, and asked him to make sure he included Randolph Air Force Base in his district. So at that time it was just pencil and paper. Lieutenant governor said, "Well, that's easy. We can put that in there." Well, this Democratic congressman didn't realize or forgot that there was a, a, a major retirement, military retirement neighborhood close to that district, close to Randolph Air Force Base. And, and of course, the next time election came up, he lost his election. So you never know what you get in terms of redistricting. So um, just, um, of course, technology has improved, but I'm sure those things happen still. So my slot, my information is going to be a little bit different than what we've talked about. We really focused on redistricting, um, and primarily because the the two things that we've already received one is the apportionment counts, which is the resident population of the state plus overseas military and federal employees um, who have their North Carolina's home of records. That's that determines the number of congressional seats. Um, and going back to New York, we we'll kind of look at that as a sad story. They you know missed that once losing that seat by 89 but the the good part of that story knowing this state demographer in new york is they thought actually they were going to lose two seats so they were actually happy to at least uh, not lose two seats so that that that's based on the efforts they put on the front end and the funding they put on the front end to make sure we had a good count as kyle pointed out we received the the first set of local data down to the block level for redistricting data. And that's also used to determine populations of cities and counties. Uh, this is very limited. It provides total population and voting age population. Of course, from that, you can derive the childhood population, um, group quarters populations for things like dorms, barracks, nursing homes, um, and also how many housing units are, are in, in each city and town and county, or you know, and again, down to the block level. The next set of data typically is what, what is called the demographic profile. Um, it provides a bit more detail than re redistricting data. It's usually five-year age groups, more information on household characteristics and family, house, and family characteristics, still somewhat limited, but it provides a little bit more detail and you can provide a little bit more information about local communities. And the one that uh, we as demographers are really looking forward to is demogra demographic and housing characteristics file. And if anybody has used census data in the past, this would be equivalent to the summary file one. And it really provides uh, information on sex or gender, single years of age, uh, more information on housing characteristics, uh, housing tenure in the past, they provide information on not only if a house was vacant, but why it was vacant. So seasonal housing is important in cer certain communities in, in North Carolina. More details on family characteristics and, and household living arrangements as well. So that's, that's the data we're really looking forward to because that helps us understand a little bit more about our communities. Now this is uh, 
from work put together by Ad, um, Andrew we uh, Re Reamer in uh, George Washington University. They looked at federal funds distributed to local communities. Um, and we think about the decennial census as every 10 years, but in reality, the Census Bureau is active throughout the decade, either in pre preparation. In fact, we've already had meetings on preparing for the 2030 census. And, but they also do things like the American Community Survey. They do some um, other surveys uh, to find out more about the population. Um, and those, either the decennial census or those surveys and, um, and sample programs, estimates created from the census are used to distribute federal funds as well as state funds to local communities. And I won't go into all these details, but this gives you the scope of all these different types of information that, that are provided to allocate federal funds to local communities and as well as state funds to local communities. So there's things like simply classifying geographic areas. So what is urban and rural? There's a lot of different definitions of urban and rural and depending on the program, uh, they look at population densities, they look at metropolitan, non-metropolitan status based on commuting patterns and population sizes of communities. Or they look at things like uh, the uh, um, information about um, uh, indicators like personal income, median household income, per capita income, uh, all those things are used or initially derived from the decennial census. So federal and state programs are uh, allocated to local communities or local agencies or people based on simply based on the allocation, almost all programs use some sort of census derived data to determine if, um, the spending to local communities based on how many people are in an area or how many people live in rural areas or how many people um, are, of, are in poverty. Those simple allocations to, to the states or to local communities or nonprofit groups or even to uh, certain eligible businesses as well. Uh, there's also many of the programs use census derived numbers for um, determine eligibility. So if, you, if you're um, have a certain income, is that above or below the median household in income within your local area? So that may be a way of determining your eligibility for a particular program. According to, to the accounting for dollars, about 23, almost $24 billion in federal funds are spent in North Carolina. Um, and again, these could be funds sent directly to state government for different programs or directly to local governments for uh, programs or to nonprofits, to uh, hospitals, to uh, businesses, uh, ranging from financial assistance, matching payments, tax credit programs or just procurement programs set aside for certain programs. Uh, they also did an analysis looking at just those programs that focus on rural areas. So one, about $1.4 billion uh, are spent in North Carolina in rural areas on rural programs. For the state, um, a, at least $1.5 billion or sent to municipalities and counties. And two of the largest funding allocations that derive their numbers from the census is this municipal state street aid program, or sometimes people call this the POW bill fund. Uh, basically, um, for your local communities, your local communities get from the state funds that support maintenance of your local streets. 75% of those funds are based on a per capita, how many people are in your city on an annual basis. And uh, the remainder is how many street mileage. Also, depending on your county, your sales tax dis distributions may use a per capita method. So again, how many people are, are located in your local community? There's some counties that use an ad valorem, um, distribution, but many counties use per capita. Both of those use population estimates pr produced by my office. 
the annual population estimates. Um, and, but my population estimates start out with a good, hopefully a good census count. That's kind of a, a time that we can recalibrate for uh, going forward. Again, so the census counts are important for answering questions of how many people are in the labor force, how many uh, households or people are in poverty, things like, even things like, if you look down at the bottom, who spends time on hunting, fishing, or observing wildlife? There is a uh, hunting, fishing, and wild, wildlife observation survey that the Fish and Wildlife uh, Service uses to determine who's, who are, what are the characteristics of people going to, uh, going hunting or going to look, look at birds. Um, they require a good base to understand the frame of the population in, in order to, uh, if they're doing a sample survey, they got to know in general how many people there are in the United States or in a particular state and what the, the general characteristics are. And then they can do a sample and then weight that sample to that population. So it's very important to have a good base to begin with. Again, probably the, the data that are uh, most important, or the, maybe not most important, but because I'm involved in them, I guess they're important, but on an annual basis, we do the Census Bureau does population estimates. Those start out with a good census count and they recalibrate, they look at their models, make sure that they're still estimating the population as well as they can. And, um, and then from er the next 10 years, they're estimating the population every year for states, for counties, for incorporated places or municipalities. And for some states they, where they have an active township, they also estimate population for those areas. The housing unit counts we get from the census also are a starting point for our annual population estimates. And again, in our office, we do our own annual population estimates. They're similar to, but not the same as the Census Bureau. We provide state and county estimates by race, ethnicity, age, and sex. And then for municipalities, total population. And again, those municipal estimates are used for allocation of um, state street aid funds and distribution of sales tax. Beyond those two main programs there are also programs like uh, community arts programs use some their funding formula use uses population. Uh, there are uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, North Carolina Department of Commerce uses a tier system to allocate funds to distressed counties. Those look at things like population change. They look at things like median household income. Um, and unemployment rates. All of those factors need a good population base to start out uh, to be able to estimate those accurately. And this just gives you an example of what's happened, an, an example of that tier designation. The tier designation uses there are a, a gazillion different ways of, of classifying rural areas and urban areas, but the North Carolina Rural Center, uh, they they just use simply 250 people per square mile as urban, anything less than that is rural. Um, that is used within the tier designation as well. And just kind of give you a, a, an update on that. There's 80 rural, rural counties in North Carolina based on the 2010 census and 20 urban counties. These include uh, suburban and uh, regional centers as their other classifications. Um, going back to Kyle's, uh, presentation. Um, 51 of those counties, all of those counties were rural. Two of those counties that were designated as rural in 2010 will graduate and become urban based on the new 2020 numbers. That's Johnston County and Onslow County. Uh, even though 40% of the population is in, in rural counties, 8% of our growth was there. 92% was in the urban counties. But so that's, that's one way of classifying urban and rural, and that's used in different allocations um, from the state. Similarly, at the federal level, they will look at metropolitan versus non-metropolitan counties, which is gonna show a little bit 
different list of counties. They may look at urban and rural, which is based simply on um, density. So you can have Wake County, there's urban areas within Wake County, there's rural areas. I think you can think of it as, as growing up, we used to always, do you live in the city or out in the country? So it's kind of the low rural, uh, rural density population. Another thing that we use, the, the census counts for, and what we're really looking forward to, that more detailed information coming out next year, that age characteristics information, that helps us to prepare our projections to look out uh, now, our la latest projections looked out to 2050, so that the state can plan for transportation services, schools uh, in the future, any sort of infra infrastructure in the future, as well as businesses can plan for where the population may be um, in the next 20, 30, uh, or 20 or 30 years. Um, and this just gives you an overview of our latest projections that were produced in January of this year. Uh, prior to receiving the decennial census numbers, we did include some uh, implications from COVID which impacted deaths, but also our fertility rate as well. So this gives you, a, this information is very important to plan for local transportation needs, for school enrollment and uh, other infrastructure, infrastructure needs of the local community. And I'll end it with that. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, we had one question a little earlier, and I think you you may be able to answer it, or maybe Kyle will. Um, one of our um, attendees said, I think North Carolina participation in the census was 65%, but we're also talking about how accurate it is. How can those two things be uh, both be true? So I think there's a little bit of confusion. So that 65% is what, what is called self-response. And the reason why we want to get, and I kind of touched on this earlier, um, the reason why we want to get that number as high as we can is because if you're responding to the census, you're going to more likely to, to provide the information, that the complete information. So you're going to provide information on how many people live in your household, uh, race, race and ethnic background, age characteristics, all that information um, will be complete. And so that's why they really want to get a self-response first because, and beyond that, it's actually cheaper. So if you respond then they don't have to send somebody out to knock on the door or do some checks on administrative records to, to basically fill in that gap. So even though the self-response is 65%, that isn't necessarily the complete count of the population. Um, and in fact, I think it, by the end, uh, they, they have an operation called uh, non-response follow-up where they go out, knock on the doors. If you don't respond, they'll talk to your neighbors um, and ask for information. If they don't know, then they'll go to administrative records. And then the last thing they do is do imputation based on the characteristics of surrounding households. So uh, that at least what, what has been reported by them, it was 99.9% .9 completion by the end of it all. Great. Um, just as a comment to those of you attending, if you haven't taken a look at the chat, there's a lot of really great resources in there, um, several links, you could get additional information as well as some explanations about what's going on with current redistricting process. All right, let me check and see what additional questions we have in the chat. So here's a, here's a political question. Um, how will district being renumbered impact campaigns? So if, um, if congressional district was number two and um, it changes to a different number, how does that impact campaigns? And um, then a, I'll, I'll let you answer that if anyone can. I'll, I'll take a stab at it, um, but obviously if Kyle and Mike have things to add, I'd love to hear them. Um, I guess, first of all, I wouldn't yet get too um, 
fixated on what the numbers are. So just to, an easy example. So the, and the reason it's easy is because it's wedged in the corner of the state. So the 11th Congressional District, Farthest West District, Madison Cawthorn's District um, is, you know, you got a few other states on each side. So there's really not that much action that can happen. There, um, some of the maps have the far Western District keeping that 11 name, which it's had for since the 1800s. Some of the maps have it changing to 14, right? With the notion that you would sort of roughly number from East to West. I don't know what they're going to do. Obviously, if the past is any guide, they're going to hold on to 11. So I, I wouldn't yet worry about that. I think the real effect on campaigns is how um, how the district shifts in terms of, you know, who they would represent, right? Um, and I think it's a really good time to point out for Congress, there's another difference between Congress and the General Assembly. For Congress, you don't have to live in your district. You just have to live in the state. So if they redraw your line in some way and you're slightly outside, you could still run. For the General Assembly, you have to live in your district. So all these kind of micro level carve outs are in some ways more critical at the General Assembly level than they are at the congressional level. Um, as far as the number themselves, you know, I don't know. I never see, it's a good question. I've never seen any research on it. I wonder, my guess is it'll matter more in ones that have had consistent numbering over time. Um, there's some in our state that have, and there's some that have shifted around a lot, but um, I don't, can't think of any article that I've read that specifically looks at that question. Thank you. Um, so I've heard speculation that Mecklenburg and Wake will be divided up into four or more districts. Is there any truth to that? And would it withstand a court case? So I can try to start on this, Chris, if it's all right. And what I would like to start with, and, and I think some of us can nerd out on this information. We've been at NC Counts compiling a lot of the resources and information that you all will need or want. Um, and so just sharing that in chat, there's a lot of information in here, right? So there's advocacy information for folks who want, you know, to um, have talking points for their public comments. But if you if you scroll down a few things that you'll see, and, and Chris, one thing that you might nerd out in is the comments from the NCGA portal have been sorted to include commun uh, communities of interest. So there's some social science folks who might want to code that. But also, we've got some analysis um, in here from some of the people in the area who are doing this work. And so the draft maps we've received from the legislature have, um, some of them have been put into the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. That's a national project, and they're providing grades. Their grading is mostly based on partisanship, so we won't see a lot of information on racial equity or the um, Voting Rights Act in there. Um, so that's in there. And then also uh, Common Cause has done a really great analysis. And there's two articles that came out of, out of uh, Common Cause this past week from the organization, um, you know, giving some their analysis of it. Um, I think with, with note, in the comments, we're seeing a lot of folks, they want to keep the triad together. But in some of the maps, we're seeing the triad is being split. And so that, I think, is the biggest um, some of the biggest uh, concerns that have been articulated so far. To answer your question, though, and I might have to turn over to Chris, I haven't paid enough attention to Mecklenburg and Wake being divided. And I don't think I've seen it divided yet on any of the draft maps, but I might be wrong. Um, and so um, that tool also has a link to the General Assembly's website. It's sort of hidden. And so you can find the draft maps. Um, you, there's a link to the draft map so you can see, see it for yourself. Uh, but again, these are just drafts right now. I don't even think they've debated these right uh, uh, yet. So, I'll just piggyback. Uh, one, thanks so much for sending this resource. Looks amazing. So, <laughs> I had no idea. This is great. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything. I probably rarely have things smart to say, but in particular in this in this time, I have seen some potential maps that would split um, Mech four ways. Um, whether that would survive a court challenge, I'm not going to weigh in. I think it depends what court, what case, how, all that. But um, let's just say that I'm immediately brought to attention when I hear about um, a county being split four ways. I just, uh, how's that for a slightly politic answer to a very good question? Uh, 
So just to follow up on the, the district numbers changing, here's the example this person wants to know about. Uh, so if Deborah Ross currently represents district, Congressional District 2, hypothetically that becomes Congressional District 5, does she now um, switch to becoming the rep for District 5 or does she stick with being the rep for District 2, wherever that happens to be? Or does that shift only happen at election time? Well, it, it kind of depends on what she decides to do. Um, again, because they can, they can technically run in any district in the state. So, you know, my guess is she would. It, it really depends on how far out of district. So let's just play it out with the Virginia Fox example, since that's one that is at least in some of the maps, right? So again, Virginia Fox lives. If you can imagine Watauga County, you can imagine the southwestern portion of Watauga County. She, her house is roughly there. And so some of the maps include all of Watauga County in the 11th, some include all of Watauga County in the 5th, some include this little carve out. I have no idea Virginia Fox would not return my phone call, I'm sure if I called her right now, but my guess is if she were, you know, five blocks outside of District 5 or else, she'd still run in District 5, right? If it were significantly outside, I think that's maybe a different question. So they do have a lot of age, complete agency to decide where they're gonna run. Um, so I, I, it's a really good question. I, I fear that I'm giving an unsatisfactory answer, but I think it's because it really is up to the individual who's running. Again, General Assembly, different deal, but for Congress, that's the deal. Thanks. Um, okay, so if we end up in court over the current redistricting, is there any hope that a remedy would happen before November 2022? Kyle, you're a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I and, and I, I well, Chris, let me say I'm a I'm a reforming lawyer, right? A recovering <laughs> lawyer, I think they call it. They um you know, the, I think any litigation, it's just a fair sense that it, it is a crystal ball, right? Um, there might be some initial immediate injunctive relief that they seek um, from the courts. So things might move fast uh, because of that, but that's just, you know, a temporary band-aid that doesn't, you know, doesn't even really heal anything, doesn't change anything. Um, and so, no, I, I think that is a crystal ball question. And I think the court challenge then leads to more redistricting, which may then lead to more court challenges. Um, I think just in terms of the criteria, right? So populations need to be even. Um, we have this sense that I think the biggest challenge in my mind, and if I was a betting man, I'd say the biggest challenge is gonna come from their um, criteria, which says you shall not use racial data because I do not think you can know whether you're upholding the Voting Rights Act <laughs> without knowing what the data that you're upholding is, right? So, and I and I know reasonable minds will disagree, but um, um, I think that's a huge challenge that they have. Yeah, it is a crystal ball. It absolutely is. Uh, let's see. Uh, should Justices Berenger and Berger voluntarily recuse themselves if redistricting issues hit the North Carolina Supreme Court. I'm going to give this one to you too, Kyle. <laughs> wow, I, I'm, 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 I paid for that. I paid for that law. To... <laughs> you know, um, oh man, I, you know, <laughs> it is such a difficult question because what I often think you know, should be a, a barrier for someone to recuse themselves in those situations. Other folks don't agree. And so I, I can't speak for those justices. I also know, um, you know, there there's some um, talk that, um, you know, for the, for the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court that, you know, uh, Justice Earls may want to recuse herself as well. Be, but I, I don't think she should because, you know, that's a conversation where she has the experience, but this is an act of litigation that she's ever done under these set of circumstances, right? And so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, 
where to begin with that analysis. And I, and I would absolutely need probably six or seven hours of research time and a strong drink <laughs> to give you that information. <laughs> oh, thanks <Yeah>. so much. <laughs> um, are there any other questions from folks attending? If you don't know how to do the chat and you prefer to do a raise hand, please uh, feel free to raise your virtual hand. Well, I don't see any other questions, so. Susan um, Marshall, yeah. Susan oh. Marshall, you're still on mute though, I think. Yeah, sorry, I've got a cat in my lap and can't do the, uh, find the, the virtual raise hand. So this may be unfair because it just was in this morning's paper, but there was a, an article on some of the proposed maps and one of which had an, I think it was 11 to three Republican advantage, the way it was drawn. I was struck by something that one of you said, I don't remember which one, which was that the maps were supposed to be drawn without partisan data. That would seem to contradict what those maps show. So how, I guess, just what's your comment on that? Clearly they're using partisan data and clearly calling them out won't do anything because we've been doing that for years. So just what do you think about that, I guess, is the question. Oh God stuck with the last two really good questions. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll jump on this one just because I, I feel bad that he got the, <laughs> got the last two really good ones that were hard to answer. Um, so the rule is they can't use partisan data when they're in the room drawing the maps. They can only, right, and, and they have to draw, the only maps that can be considered are ones that are drawn in that room, right? Those are facts. So there's three ways I think I can imagine a map coming up 10-3. I'm not going to weigh in on any of these. I'm going to try to give my best take on all three. One is it's happenstance, right? One, and, and certainly that's what the person who drew the 10-3 map is going to say, right? That they just they happen to draw those. They were, had other overriding concerns. And it happened to be that the way these people and the voting patterns seem to be clustered together, it just worked out this way, right? Just randomness. Um, another view, uh, slightly more cynical, you can decide for yourself if it's more accurate, would be that, um, and I'll kind of move up in, in levels of cynicism, that, uh, that state legislators just know this stuff, right? That just by like being a member of the General Assembly, you know what precincts go a certain way, voting tabulation districts go a certain way, which counties go a certain way, right? You don't have to be, you don't have to have the data in front of you to know that Northern Mecklenburg County and Southern Mecklenburg County tend to be the most Republican parts of Mecklenburg County, for example. And so you could draw those not using partisan data, but just using what you happen to know. The slightly more ramped up cynical version would be that uh, uh, anybody, you, me, a member of the General Assembly, Roy Cooper, whoever, can get on Dave's redistricting app or any of the other redistricting apps at home figure out exactly where these lines are, figure out exactly what the uh, resulting maps would look like and have that knowledge when they go in the room to draw the maps. So I, as I see them, those are the three options. I will let you, all you smart people decide for yourself which of those three you think is the most likely. Anybody else wanna weigh in on that one? I'm just glad that y'all are getting those 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 that's out of my my ball ball field so <laughs> well and, and i have and, to weigh in on that <laughs> well i think chris you you hit the nail on the head the only thing i would just add is i was looking at the the, the floor I, I don't even think it was a debate it was a floor discussion about how they're doing the process and there were some legislators who asked the question right um well are you going to check our you know make sure we don't have our phones when we get to the computer terminals are you going to look through our um, you know, briefcases or, what, or will you know who's sitting next to us, right? And and the response from the for the for folks uh, from the chair was, well, we're not going to, we trust each other. We're not going to police ourselves. And so, you know, that information, right, of, of what materials they have when they're sitting there, that's what they said. But, you know, there's there's no policing. They're, they're, they're 
they're busy policing everyone else. I, I'm sorry, that was not an NC Counts comment there. Thanks. So uh, Mary has her hand raised. She's also typed into the chat. Do you want me to read the chat out, Mary, or do you want to ask your uh, question? Uh, just read the chat, please. <laughs> Great. Uh, so Mary would like to get your opinions on uh, whether this redistricting process is damaging to democracy. I, well, Mike, if you want to talk about on the budget side, I mean, because I, I you know. I, I really can't speak strictly to that, but I think Chris kind of talked a little bit about it. It's not necessarily, I mean, there's a redistricting issue, but there's also just the way people have sorted themselves out. So, which makes it harder to redistrict. And I think it, in a way it pulls people apart. I mean, we talk about rural and urban, um, you know, that's North Carolina. We've always, even if you grew up in an urban area, haven't ever been on a farm, it's kind of like, we like to talk about we're a rural state, even though we're becoming much more urban state. So I think there's, there's those divisions where we're kind of sorting themselves out and that, that plays out nationally as well. So, which I think makes it harder to, to redistrict, but, um, I can't really, you know, talk about the redistricting. I don't really have, other than I did some redistricting back for some small rural counties. I mean, really small, like Terrell size counties, uh, after the 1990 census. And that's the last time. And, uh, the funny thing is, is the only thing that they were interested in is making sure that the number of roads were the same because that's their was their main job is to main ro maintain roads. So um, I've kind of steered clear clear of redistricting, other than answering questions about where populations may be and population change in in, in North Carolina and the projections and so forth. Kyle, you want to grab a piece of it and then maybe I'll grab a little piece of it and get out. Yeah, sure, sure. Only because you went first last time. Um, so, you know, I, I think in my mind, sort of the, the backdrop to all this is in a democracy, right? The democracy we believe in, we fight for, it's the people picking their representatives and not the other way around, right? And so I think in, in, in regards to those concerns of knowing that in the criteria, they did place communities of interest or communities of consideration at the bottom. And then they, and I don't know if it's an order of preferences that, that has been sorted through, but then they also have in there, you know, members can consider their home address, um, you know, in, in redistricting, that sort of thing. I, I think um, also overlaid with that is, is the sense that, you know, there, there's, there are some systemic barriers in this state, right? I mean, we've, we've got in Durham, I know I live in Durham, you have 147 was was built and created and it went straight through the African American community, right? And it, and so these things that we've been fighting for from the 50s, from way, way, way back ago, you know, you, you want to make sure you're helping these communities out, that you're doing the right thing for them. And so I think a large concern is the process, right? Um, releasing draft maps on a Thursday having two hearings on Monday and Tuesday, which gives you four days of analysis of really I mean, you know, you could have people working on months to analyze this stuff down to it, but giving folks four days to do that, I don't think it's fair. Um, there's no talks of whether there's going to be interpreters provided. They weren't last time. We had in Durham people from the community coming in to interpret for folks who wanted to speak up at the public hearings, you know. Um, we're still in a pandemic. And so, you know, the, the, the protocols and all of that, I just, I just feel like even though you know, there have been public hearings and, and we've been calling for transparency and all of that. You compare 13 hearings before the maps were drawn to 62 in the last cycle. There, there's a bit of a shortfall here. There, there's, there's a lot lacking. And so I think a portion of this concern is that, yeah, the, the process has not been what, what it could be in 2021 with Zoom technology and, and just so much information. And we've also been lacking the education from the uh, legislature, because I think because the power is only in their hands, you know, they're going to do um, what they think is right versus what may be best for the people. Um, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Though. I think it's great answer. Both both answers are great. I yeah, I think this is a bad way to to run a democracy. I mean, I, I don't, and I think the same thing was true 
when the Democrats held the majority. Um, and I think, I wish we could reframe this debate about what it really is, which is, uh, should be a bipartisan reform effort. I am encouraged to see um, people like John Hood and um, people like Chuck McGrady, former Republican uh, General Assembly member. So John Hood with the John Locke Foundation, of course, being really involved with redistricting efforts. Um, I was at a, a redistricting conference at Duke the other week and Art Pope was on a panel with Tom Ross, right? So it's hard for me to think of, of you know, somebody more associated with the Republican majority in North Carolina than Art Pope. And here Art Pope is saying, hey, I want redistricting reform. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm the guy who wrote the very first redistricting reform proposal to introduce in the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, so I think this is a, a bad way to run a democracy and it doesn't matter who's doing it. Um, I think we need to frame it that way. But look, I don't think anybody would look with a straight face and say that the General Assembly by themselves should be able to draw maps which will elect them, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, you know, I th the best arguments I hear for our current process are they did it that way before, therefore we get to do it now. And I just don't think, I don't find that to be compelling logic. Um, and I think it is really problematic. Um, and I, it would be on my top five list of bipartisan reforms that we should be considering and implementing in the state of North Carolina. I think that is a really great place to wrap up today. I cannot tell you how much we have enjoyed hearing from all three of you. Um, it's great perspective. I know so much more at this point than I've ever known about the census and its impact. Um, again, to our attendees, there's some great resources in the chat. So if you have not already gotten a copy of those or clicked on the links, please do that while we wrap up today. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica. Holy cow, this was awesome, y'all. This was fantastic. Thank you, Kyle, Chris, and Michael. This was amazing. Great information. And also to all of those folks who have attended today, the questions, outstanding. Again, just one of those events where politicas, you guys knock it out of the park. Um, I also want to say thanks to the folks who helped put this together. So our volunteers, Sandra, wow. Dana, again, wow. Naomi, Susan, Wida, um, thank you guys so much for your, your participation and for putting this together and um, monitoring chat and Susan and Wida for being our Zoom experts. Also real quick, just wanna highlight a couple of things for y'all. Put on your calendar, we're having it. The member celebration, November 16th. We're gonna be inside outside. So, so we're making this happen. We're gonna do this. November 16th, put it on your calendar. And then also don't forget the way that you can um, communicate, join us, like us, follow us. We've got the website, we've got Instagram, Facebook, and um, thanks y'all. Have a great afternoon and uh, we'll talk to y'all soon. <laughs>